When a species goes extinct, that's the end. Or is it? Scientists are trying to bring back extinct species, everything from the woolly mammoth to what was once the most abundant bird in the world. If we do that just right, they lay an egg and out hatches a passenger pigeon. Bringing species back might be a way to correct past mistakes, but just because we can, should we? Coming up on Quest, Reawakening Extinct Species. Support for KQED Science is provided by the National Science Foundation, the Fallis Family Fund, the Mary Van Voorhees Fund, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, the Wincoat Foundation, and the Amgen Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED. I never wore boots growing up. I was from North Dakota, cowboy country, but I never wore them. So these are my grandfather's boots. When he passed away, it turned out that I was the only one in the family who was the exact same size he is. So, uh, so I took his boots and I've been wearing them ever since. The first pigeon I ever raised was given to me by my grandfather. He absolutely loved them. And I'm pretty sure that's why I ended up loving birds as well. At the University of California, Santa Cruz, 27-year-old Ben Novak is one of about a dozen scientists worldwide working in the new field of de-extinction. Their goal is to do something that may sound like science fiction, bring back species that have disappeared from the planet. Novak is working to de-extinct the passenger pigeon. Among the world's 300 pigeons and doves, it stood out for being elegant, fast, and the most abundant bird in the world. Well, I first discovered the passenger pigeon in a bookstore. I was a naive junior high student. I fell in love with the bird just from, just from seeing it. The blue, the red, the fanned tail, and those swift wings. In the early 1800s, there were five billion of these birds, just in the United States. Within the span of about 50 years, they go extinct. This amazing, beautiful bird that I've just fallen in love with is extinct, so I can't see them. And there's this absolute scale to its population that I can't even wrap my head around. That sealed the deal for me. I was a passenger pigeon enthusiast, and I will be until the day I die. Even though 20 years ago the concept of recreating an extinct organism was complete science fiction, we now have the building blocks of science to do this. I'll be right back. Sarah, no, no! The human desire to come face to face with long gone animals isn't new. Robert Burke said that the T Rex was a rogue who would abandon its young at the earliest opportunity. I know I can prove otherwise. In the 1993 blockbuster Jurassic Park and its sequel Lost World, scientists venture onto a tropical island to get a close-up look at cloned dinosaurs. The movies portrayed them with gripping realism, but 65 million years after their extinction, there's no chance they're coming back. Jurassic Park is a fantasy and always will be. Dinosaurs are way too old to think that we're going to be able to recover genetic material. Because DNA only lasts about 100,000 years, scientists are now focusing on species that disappeared within that time frame, and they're trying different approaches to bring them back. Scientists have already revived one extinct animal. The last of a type of mountain goat was cloned in Spain in 2003 from a skin sample taken while she was still alive. Her clone only lived a few minutes, and researchers repeated their attempts in 2014. 
In Australia, scientists are attempting to clone a unique frog that gave birth through its mouth. And the Tasmanian tiger, a carnivore that carried its young in a pouch. And in the Netherlands, researchers are breeding cattle to closely resemble the aurochs, the ancestors of all modern cows and bulls. And then there's groups like us at Revive and Restore thinking about bringing back the passenger pigeon. And that's going to be kind of a new terrain where we're actually going to be using genome engineering. The nonprofit group's idea is to take its closest living relative, the band-tailed pigeon, and genetically engineer it into a passenger pigeon. We have four in the collection. These are the two that look the best of the ones that we've got. And we thought a male and a female would be appropriate. I had no idea that Oakland had any. <laughs> so I was really excited to learn about pigeons that I hadn't heard about yet. Because I want to see them all. That's, that's the goal. Today makes number 338 and number 339 that I have seen. You have this beautiful, long, dove-shaped tail. These very swift wings. Very pointed, very narrow for speed. In the 1800s, people are reporting them to maybe have been flying at around 60 miles per hour. Oh my gosh. Not to be confused with domesticated carrier pigeons, passenger pigeons were wild birds that migrated through the eastern and central U.S. and Canada. They traveled by the millions, swallowing acorns whole and destroying trees under their weight. Naturalist John James Audubon once wrote that their flocks obscured the sun like an eclipse. There is no pigeon today that flies in flocks like the passenger pigeon used to. Stories say sometimes they'll be two miles wide by five, six miles long. You had these giant flocks of birds so dense that with a single shot you could take down dozens of them. Or you could lure them into an area and net them. Shipped by the trainloads to feed hungry cities, the passenger pigeon went extinct in the wild in the late 1800s. The few birds in captivity slowly died out, until only one, named Martha, was left at the Cincinnati Zoo. Her death in 1914 meant the end of the passenger pigeon. That a huge population could just go to zero. Um, that was the beginning of taking extinction seriously. And so to go back to that original mistake or crime and try to undo it, there might be some redemption in that. Seven. Stuart Brand Five. has been calling the public's attention to the environment Two. since the 1960s. Let's go! His whole earth catalog taught a generation everything from growing food to building their own wind turbines. It was a counterculture in love with high tech and became part of what's called the modern environmental movement, which has now become a bit antiquated in my humble opinion, um, because it did not embrace technology, uh, I think the way it should have, especially biotechnology. Do you want extinct species back? Do you want extinct species back? That to me is the wrong attitude. We're lost uh, unless we realize that we're just a part of this intricate web. And spe we ought to bring species back if they can help maintain that web. But not because it makes us feel better and sleep better at night. The enterprise of reviving disappeared species is driven at least in part by the increasing extinction rate that scientists have observed in the past 500 years. This case contains some of the most valuable specimens on our collection. There are actually only two keys to this case. I have one and the collection manager has the other. Here are the Carolina parakeets, and they were quite common um, in the 1800s and were probably driven extinct largely by hunting because um, they did affect farmers and crops. Because they were gregarious, like many parrots are, they would shoot one, the others would continue to flock around that one fallen brother and they could pick off the other ones. This one is the moho. The kings in Hawaii would use this little bit of yellow in their capes. These are our ivory-billed woodpeckers, 
and they were in the news a lot recently because there was a population believed to have been found in the big woods of Arkansas. And they had hoped that some feathers that they had found in the field might have come from ivory-billed woodpeckers. Unfortunately, they all turned out to be other species. When a species goes extinct, that's the end. Those genes are gone. That job in the ecosystem is gone. That niche disappears. So there's nothing left to serve that purpose. Humans are the reason why species are going extinct at a higher rate. Human population sizes are so big that we're having a huge impact destroying habitat and converting habitat from its natural form into agriculture, to cities, to other things that we use. Climate change is making things worse by turning the oceans inhospitable to coral reefs, for example. Some scientists estimate that if temperatures continue to climb, they could contribute to the disappearance of half the world's species. To the extent that we want to preserve anything that we love, you have to work at that. And if de-extinction is a part of that, I think it's a wonderful tool to have in your toolbox. If you've got some ecosystem that we know is collapsing because we've lost some key ecosystem component and we can de-extinct it, why wouldn't we do that? I would put my emphasis on maintaining what we have and preventing further extinctions. If we have these technologies and these technologies can be brought to bear to help preserve what is already here, that's where I would put my resources. Hey Ben. Hey. Hey, how you doing? Good. Doing good. Did you get a cup of coffee yet? Ben Novak wrote us a very endearing letter that um, just said, you know, since the time I was 13, I've been wanting to do exactly this, you know. And Stuart and I looked at each other and said, how can we not hire this guy? Have you seen this cool thing? Uh, well, according to Amazon, it's not published yet. <laughs> Ryan Phelan and Stuart Brand's nonprofit, Revive and Restore, in Sausalito, California, is paying for Novak to work at the University of California, Santa Cruz. They estimate it'll take five to fifty million dollars to bring back the passenger pigeon. One question that has come up from a, a potential funder who actually talked with Stuart and I and said, you know, if we were to put in a six-figure number, you know, how could it help fast track what you're doing? Say it's a hundred thousand. What could a hundred thousand do for us? Well, I think a hundred thousand can easily do more than one comparative genomic study where the money tends to be coming in is not from traditional conservation donors, but from people in high tech. They like being on cutting edges, and this is one. Phelan, who is married to Brand, knows about being on the cutting edge. She helped pioneer personal genetic testing over the web with her company DNA Direct, which she sold in 2010. I've seen the power of these technologies in human health. You wouldn't want to have cancer today and not know that your tumor has been sequenced. I believe that that will happen exactly with conservation. Phelan and Brand have enlisted George Church, one of the pioneers of genome editing. The scientific breakthroughs that are making this de-extinction even plausible and, and now uh, quite reasonable it, it are two. One is our ability to read ancient DNA, and the second is our ability to change the genomes of birds and, and mammals. To bring back the passenger pigeon, scientists will genetically engineer its closest relative, which turns out to be a pigeon from the West Coast. In Riverside, California, Sal Alvarez is one of the few breeders in the country who raises the band-tailed pigeon. To turn it into a passenger pigeon, researchers will have to make its square tail and its wings more aerodynamic. The band under its tail would be replaced with dots. On the males, the chest would become red and the wings blue. The process begins with the sequencing of the band-tailed pigeon's genome. Alvarez contributed a blood sample from one of his pigeons. So this is actually the pigeon that we picked out to do all the testing from. We named it Sally. Ryan and Stuart, they both came up with that name because of my name being Sal. <laughs> Once Sally's genome has been sequenced, Novak will compare it to the passenger pigeon's genome. Because it's extinct, 
Researchers have to sequence its DNA from specimens stored at museums like the California Academy of Sciences. You can take a little tiny snippet of this dried toe skin, and we find that the DNA is pretty easy to get out of there. It's very degraded, but it's in better shape than some of the other parts of the body. Even though researchers have plenty of passenger pigeon DNA to work with, they face a challenge. DNA from a dead animal is broken into many tiny pieces and needs to be painstakingly assembled, like a puzzle. What would be really helpful would be if we were to have the box top that goes with that puzzle, with the picture on it that we could use to try to piece these little pieces together. When we're working with an extinct species, we don't have that. Instead, we can figure out what that puzzle top should look like for the band-tailed pigeon. And then we're going to use that to try to piece together these tiny little broken fragments and come up with the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon genes that aren't present in the band-tailed pigeon's genome could turn out to be what gives the extinct bird its unique traits, its red breast or its swift wings and long tail. Once scientists figure out what those genes are, they'll build them in the lab using chemical compounds. Then they plan to insert those passenger pigeon genes into band-tailed pigeon cells using new genome editing technology. It's like very precise scissors that allow you to cut and splice with unprecedented accuracy and, and ease of use. Our experience with the editing technologies is they work on every organism we've tried, from plants to fungi and so forth. The last step would be to insert those new cells into band-tailed pigeon eggs. If we do that just right, we'll get band-tailed pigeons that carry the sperm and the eggs of passenger pigeons, so that when you take a male and a female, breed them together, they lay an egg, and out hatches a passenger pigeon. Then, the chick would need a name. If you turn a band-tailed pigeon into a passenger pigeon, is it really a passenger pigeon, or is it just some weird kind of chimera or hybrid or what? And the answer is we don't know yet. Uh, and you won't really know until you try it. The new birds would join other types of birds that have been successfully bred in captivity. Some of the strategies might seem far-fetched, Humans have served as surrogate parents for the California condor. And they take to the air to help whooping cranes migrate. With the passenger pigeon, one goal would be to teach the birds to stick together so they won't go off and join flocks of other pigeon species. We could take white rock pigeons, train them to fly from one area to another to be our adult flock of birds, and then we could dye their feathers, blue on the back, red on the breasts, make them look like passenger pigeons so that our baby passenger pigeons see a flock of passenger pigeons going from one area to another. But a key question has never been answered. We don't know anything about whether or not the passenger pigeon needs to exist in huge numbers in order to survive at all. To anyone who really wants to bring the passenger pigeon back to life, I'd say that knowing whether or not they're going to need to bring back billions of them is probably a pretty good question. Shapiro and Novak are doing genetic studies to clarify whether or not passenger pigeons can only survive in huge flocks. This will help determine if there's actually enough forest to support them. It's a minuscule amount compared to what it was in pre-industrial revolution days. The eastern deciduous forest has made a great comeback in the last 100 years. Talking with a number of different conservationists, they really do believe that there is habitat there. Even if there is enough forest for the passenger pigeon, the revived bird could end up in conflict with humans once again, especially if it were listed under the Endangered Species Act. If it's an endangered species, then all of a sudden, all of the forest habitat where it goes into will be off limits to hunting and hiking and biking. And I'm not sure that that would be something that was well received by segments of the population. Will the people in the East Coast be willing to put up with thousands of pigeons defecating all over everything? Realistically, it probably is 20 years before we'll see them in the, in the wild again. I'd like to see that happen in 15. But we also have to allow the time. 
people have to want this pigeon back. But skepticism seems to be coming from all corners, even from within the team working with Ben Novak. Though his boss at the university is researching why passenger pigeons became so abundant, she doesn't think it's a good idea to bring them back. Why the passenger pigeon? Why do you want to bring this bird back and not something else, not something that is less annoying? Annoying? <laughs> well, that's the misconception. It's... How is a billion birds flying overhead a misconception about annoyingness? We know that they existed in the billions. Yes. The new population doesn't necessarily have to be a huge population. It can be a smaller population of birds living a lot more like band-tail pigeons and serving their ecological role in the East. Why not something that is going to fill a role, for example, that might help other species, like the mammoth, for example. There is a place where you could put them in, in the Arctic where they might actually help to reinvigorate the environment. The passenger pigeon would not fill a niche that's been vacated. It would make itself a nuisance. So I'm unconvinced. The passenger pigeon can come in and play an element in shaping the types of trees that become successful. and. That's the role that I see the passenger pigeon coming back to play. While the passenger pigeon might one day help restore the forest by spreading seeds around, scientists have even bigger plans for the woolly mammoth. George Church is engineering elephant cells with genes that would give them thick fur and a fatty layer. His hope is that these new mammoths could help keep the Arctic from melting. Scientists believe that grazing by herbivores like mammoths strengthened the grass that grew on top of the permafrost and protected it from the sun. The mammoths may have had a big role in maintaining the grass that stabilized the ice, which contains more carbon in it, as in global warming carbon, than all of the rainforest put together times two. How many woolly mammoths would you have to have coursing across Siberia. Siberia is not exactly a small place, you know, to have that kind of global impact to keep the permafrost from melting. Even scientists skeptical of de-extinction believe that any technology developed to bring back extinct species could be useful to help endangered species. This technology will be tremendously useful in conservation biology, uh, for example, to re-engineer lost diversity into populations that have recently become very, very small and are on the verge of extinction. The northern white rhinoceros at the San Diego Zoo's Safari Park in Escondido, California, are so endangered that they risk one day being only on the park sign. Right now, she kind of prefers alfalfa. We usually don't feed this to our white rhinos, but she's geriatric and there's no need for her not to have her favorite food. The San Diego Zoo's Nola and Angie are two of only seven northern white rhinos left in the world. Poached for their horns, the rhinos are believed to have disappeared in the wild around 2006. The last stronghold for the northern white rhino in its natural habitat was in Garamba National Park in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The caretakers, the rangers, the people who were protecting it and had been studying it were threatened and told to leave. At 40, the park's two rhinos have ended their baby-making years, and it's also unlikely that the other five will reproduce either. Without some extraordinary intervention, northern white rhinos are doomed. Those extraordinary measures begin with rhino cells stored at minus 250 degrees at the San Diego Zoo's Frozen Zoo. Scientists have collected cells from 12 northern white rhinos and would like to use them to increase the population's size and genetic diversity. Using stem cell techniques, scientists could produce rhino sperm and eggs. They'd then join them through in vitro fertilization to create rhino embryos. The plan would call for a close relative, southern white rhinos, to be the surrogate mothers. Those rhinos are themselves also endangered. Each of these steps has been accomplished in other species, and nobody has tried to do this with the rhinos. And if nobody tries, for sure they will become extinct. Created in the 1970s for general research purposes, the frozen zoo now holds the cells of 1,000 different species. 
One of them, a Hawaiian bird, has already gone extinct, and a handful more are on the brink. With the right technologies, their stored cells could one day become a lifeline. The wonders of life are encoded in the DNA of the vials from Arabian orcs and pygmy hippopotamuses and bighorn sheep. That's just one of the over 100 boxes in here. I show this to young scientists who come and visit and want to know what a scientist working on genetics of endangered species does. And I can say, someday you may be able to work on these samples because we've taken care of them. Support for KQED Science is provided by the National Science Foundation, the Fallis Family Fund, the Mary Van Voorhees Fund, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Capsonell Foundation, the Vadez Family Foundation, the Wincote Foundation, and the Amgen Foundation. Support is also provided by the members of KQED.